So I was almost discouraged. I almost just said, screw it. I'm just going to put all my money into index funds and the stocks and all that stuff. I'm going to be done with this real estate thing. It doesn't work in California. Did some more research, ended up realizing, okay, well, I can, there's a niche here that works. And, you know, you see like guys like me, Kevin are doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. There's a niche here that works and ended up doing that. And that's why it ended up working. So. In this video, I interview Chris Futrell. Chris is a full-time real estate agent in Southern California. He's also a rental property investor and has his own YouTube channel covering topics of real estate investing and personal finance. We cover a lot of topics that I think you guys are going to find very interesting, ranging from becoming a real estate agent to purchasing your first rental property to setting up a personal finance YouTube channel. We also talk about the future of real estate investing in California and New York. But hey, if we're just meeting, my name is Vitaly Volpov. I'm a practicing attorney, an active real estate investor, and the part owner of a real estate brokerage in upstate New York. On this channel, I discuss relevant legal concepts as well as best strategies and tips for real estate investing and personal finance. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so that YouTube notifies you of all my future content. If you enjoy the content in this video, hit the like button and comment down below. And as always, whenever I'm discussing legal or financial topics, just remember, nothing that I say in this video should be construed as legal or financial advice. I provide this information for educational and entertainment purposes only, and you should always consult with your own attorney and your own advisor before making any legal or financial decisions. Last but not least, the views and opinions that I express in this video are my own alone and don't necessarily reflect those of my law firm or any of my business partners. So with that out of the way, let's get into the video. All right, Chris. Welcome to the channel, man. Thanks for joining me. And for those viewers who don't know who you are, would you please tell them a little bit about who you are, where you're located, and what you do for a living right now? Sure. Hi, guys. My name is Chris Futrell. I'm a real estate agent in Southern California. I'm also a real estate investor. I'm in the Ventura County area. I got started selling when I was 18 years old, 21 now. And then I just recently um, started venturing into other avenues like stocks, bonds, and also starting a YouTube page. So, I guess the first thing I want to talk to you about is becoming a real estate agent. And you know, how did that come about? What was your mindset with that? Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's funny how this all came about. I actually was um, playing baseball. I was 17 and a half years old. I got injured, wasn't going to be able to play anymore. So I started looking at different avenues, went on YouTube, found a guy by the name of Brian Casella. You may or may not have ever heard of him. Uh, he was talking about sales and he actually made one video in particular that I really enjoyed. It was how he made $120,000 his first year selling real estate. I said, well, if he can do it, I want to do it. So watched all of his videos, learned some sales tactics, went down to the local Century 21 office, signed up for some courses. And about four months later, I had my real estate license and got started selling full time. I'm sure you're familiar with Graham Stephan. And he talked about that when he was first starting out on YouTube, talking about how he thought about going to college and he thought about what different career paths he might pick. And instead he ended up picking real estate and being a real estate agent specifically. Can you kind of talk about what your mindset was at the time? Yeah. My mindset at the time was I wasn't sure if college was for me or not. I didn't have that great of a GPA. I had like a 2.1. wasn't sure if I was going to be going to college or not. At best, I was going to be going to the local junior college so I was looking at different avenues. Real estate was something where I saw there's unlimited earning potential. So I said, well, I'm going to give this a shot, see what happens. Ended up doing pretty well. Sold my first house within about a month or two. Ended up doing about $2.9 in sales before I graduated. We had a pretty solid prom. I saved a good amount of money before I even graduated. And then just from there, I just continued building and continued selling. That's great, man. So from then to now, what are you doing in sales and, and what's that looking like for you in terms of earnings? Yeah. So I, when I first got started that first year, I did 2.9 million. It was about six months. And then that was the year was over. Been doing about three to three and a half million per year. Been, it's still in college. I actually ended up going the junior college route. I know some people were telling me you probably shouldn't. It takes up too much time. And it does. I was overloading myself, but I wanted to go that route. I wanted to get a degree and become a financial advisor. I re- I changed everything because now I'm like, well, I want to do good in school. My GPA almost doubled and I wanted to do good in school. I want to become a financial advisor because I thought that would be a good avenue. When you're going to a listing appointment, it's not just, oh yeah, I'm a real estate agent. Well, now I can also give you financial advice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So you completed that or are you still doing that? Still working on it currently. 
Gotcha. So how do you source your, uh, your clients, your leads right now? Yeah. When I first started, I went door knocking, you know, kind of that Mike Ferry approach where it's door knock call. I, that's not me. I don't like pressuring people. I'm not a pressury sales guy. That's just not my style. So um, mostly ended up being social media. I would make videos when I was 18. They were on my smartphone. They weren't very good. Make videos, post them, ended up getting some people who commented on them. And they ended up reaching out to me. One lady in particular ended up doing almost $2 million just from her alone. So it was mostly social media. And I'll say that's probably where I get about 35, 40% of my business. I would say the majority, if we're talking about just one particular sector of where you're getting it from, is mostly from social media. You just mentioned $2 million. And I got to ask, I mean, you, you're in California, right? Southern California? Yeah, Southern California. So I'm in New York. And some of my viewers obviously know that there are differences between East Coast and West Coast. And in particular, for me, for my state, we have New York City, which is what everybody thinks of. And of course, the home values are insane over there. And then there's kind of like the rest of the state. So for me, I'm in that rest of the state part where our prices are not as extreme as New York City and certainly not as extreme as California. But I'm curious because you've seen a lot of stuff in the news. You've seen YouTube videos about people talking about Californians leaving California and going elsewhere across the country. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you being in the market, you being in California, and you're also a real estate agent and an investor in California. What do you think about the market? Yeah, it definitely creates a cause for concern. There's so many people leaving. It's really hard to find properties that cash flow. There's not a lot of inventory, even though people are leaving. We're seeing crazy appreciation rates. So if you're trying to find something as an investment or even just a live-in with your family, it's really hard to do. The barrier of entry is really high. You can't use a low down payment because you're not going to be able to afford the monthly payment. So it's really hard to get into these properties. The prices are skyrocketing, but there's a couple of things that have been put in place by the state government that have made it more profitable to actually cash flow these deals. Okay. So like what? So it's going to be these ADU laws they put in place. Um, what they ended up doing, they call it the triplexification of California. Now you can turn single family homes into triplexes. And the way they do that is you can have a junior ADU. It has to be attached to your dwelling. So it, most people are going to use their garage. They're going to end up converting that. It's going to be about a 500 square foot space. They throw a bathroom in there, make it a studio, no big deal. That in California rents for like $1,500 a month, at least in the town I'm in. And then on top of that, they're going to add a guest house that's not attached. That's probably going to be about 400 square feet, 500 square feet. That's another $1,500. The main house itself is renting for about 3000 so now you're looking at $6,000. Your payment might be $3,200, $3,300 if you're bringing 20% down. But that's still really good cash flow numbers. It rivals a lot of places if you're able to do it right. Right. And for those people who don't know what ADU stands for, it's auxiliary uh, dwelling unit, right? Right, Chris? Yeah. So it's going to be commonly referred to as like a granny flat or a guest house. And so are you seeing a lot of clients doing that, going that route? Or is that just a new thing that not a lot of people know about yet? Yeah, it's pretty much a new thing. A lot of these laws came into place in the start of 2020. The big thing about it, the reason that's so important that it's so new is appraisers don't know how to appraise this stuff yet. So if you can find one that has a guest house, like I recently just bought one, has a guest house. The appraisal came in on that guest house at $30,000. The owner said it cost him $100,000 to build it. It wasn't even at the replacement cost of what it cost to build that in California. We know it's probably going to go back up to replacement costs once appraisers figure out how to do it. But currently what they do is they say, oh, it's storage area. They, can, they consider it like a garage. So because of that, you're able to get a good opportunity to buy something that's not even at replacement value yet and rent it for you know, a $30,000 price they put on it and rent it for $1,500. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. So I, I think that's a good segue actually to your first deal. You mentioned that you have a duplex or they maybe you turn into a duplex. So tell us a little bit about that, the numbers, kind of what went into it. And I'll ask you some follow-up questions about it as well. Sure. Sounds good. So this property was in Ventura County, ended up buying it for $689,000. The payment on it is $3,100 a month. The main house rents for $2,950. The guest house rents for $1,550. It's not a duplex. It already had a guest house in the back that the guy had built. And he'd spent all the money and it only gave him a $30,000 value. House was completely turnkey. Normally, that's not the route I would say to go. You probably want properties that you can fix up, add some value to them. This was turnkey, but because of that guest house, it ended up being a good value. So it cash flows anywhere from, depending on all the expenses, about $1,350 to $1,400 a month, free and clear after everything. 
Gotcha. What are the property taxes like for you there? It's around $7,000. It's crazy. So the property taxes are about 1.15. Okay. But it's not as high as some of the other places, New Jersey, you know, out near you. Um, but, you know, when property values are this high, it's not $300,000 like New Jersey. You're paying a lot of money in property taxes sure. in both states. But it's still really high, even though the percentage isn't that high compared to some other places. So I'm going to give you something I think will make you feel a little bit better about taxes where you are. So I, my <laughs> very first uh, property that I bought was a duplex. And I, I talk about it in a video, one of my earlier videos on my channel. And I bought it for 230,000. It might be worth 270-ish now, something like that, maybe, maybe a little bit more. And the taxes were lower, but then they reassessed the entire town. And so all the taxes went up. But I knew that you know, at the time I was buying, I knew that my taxes were gonna go up because they're gonna base the taxes on the, on the purchase price. And so when it all factors together, the school tax with the city, town, county taxes all together, I think I'm close to like $6,000 per year in taxes. So you have a 600 and some odd, you know, $700,000 house that you're paying 7,000 in taxes on in California. And I have a under a $300,000 house in upstate New York that's still getting taxed pretty comparably. So that should make you feel a little bit better. It makes me feel a little bit worse, but it is what it is. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm <laughs> sorry to hear that. That's uh, that's terrible. New York is one of the worst. And honestly, when it comes to taxes, regulation, anti-investor laws, landlord-tenant, which I think we should talk about as well. I think New York and California are vying for second and, and first places at the bottom in the country. And we just, you and I just happen to be on the opposite coast in these two states. And, and we're still able to at least I'm able to, and you can talk about this on your end, to continue expanding and looking for additional buildings, still make a profit, and still survive in that environment. Yeah, it's crazy. One of the big things about it, especially when you're in these kind of states, is for me, I bought this house. I didn't realize, you know, there's a tenant in the back house, didn't do my research on it, was a complete nightmare. Trying to get them out was a nightmare. They're threatening me, cops are called, whole deal. So from that, I realized when you're going to rent to people in these kind of states, you want to look for A-class tenants. You don't want to look for C or D-class tenants in bad areas that are not going to pay rent. And you're going to end up with these problems because you can't get them out and it's going to be a nightmare. So when you're in states that don't have landlord-friendly laws, you want to find A-class tenants. 100%. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And the other thing I said to people who ask me, what can I do right now? I'm a landlord. I think if you can get the property vacant again, right? When there's a tenant not paying, obviously it's difficult right now if they don't want to leave because the states won't allow you to evict them and the federal government too, obviously. And you've seen it. Joe Biden has extended the CDC eviction moratorium through March 31st. But once you get the property vacant, once you got the tenant out, the next thing that you should be doing is 100% vetting your tenants to the best of your ability within the laws as allowed in your state and try to get the best possible tenant you can. If you have to charge a little bit less in rent, that's better than charging more and getting the first person in the door who just happens to have cash for first month and security. And then you're going to have problems the next month. So I say that to everybody. I think that's one of the most important things to do. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. Now I'll tell you when buying my first place, I wanted to jump on the first person that asked if they can come see the property. The credit score was like 635. It wasn't as high as I was looking for. It wasn't bad. That's not a bad score, but it wasn't as high as I was looking for. And they didn't have solid income. They said they're self-employed saying they're making all this money, but I've never heard of their business and doing some research. And I'm like, wow, I just want to get someone in here. I'm super excited. That's a common mistake. I almost made it. I'm grateful. I didn't I had a family that talked me out of it, but I think that's a common mistake that a lot of people end up making. For sure. Yeah. And so are you house hacking this building or is it a pure investment for you right now? Yeah, it's a pure investment for me. I rent it out. It actually covers the room I rent because I'm trying to keep my expenses low. I'm still young, 21 years old. I don't really, I don't have a wife, don't really have any expenses. I have a dog. That's it. So trying to keep all this money that I'm making, being able to put it away, I've been able to save a good amount of money. I have a down payment for another house coming up probably four months from now. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to save and then buy another one and then rent that one out. And then maybe that third one will be the one I live in. Maybe I can get enough from these two. I'm thinking $1,500 a month in cash flow each. Maybe I'll be able to cover a mortgage out here. That's my thinking. And that's kind of where I'm going. 
So what was the financing like for this two family purchase that you have? Yeah. So we put 20% down, ended up getting a 2.99% interest rate. I was like 137,000 down, which hurt. That really hurt. Wish it would have been lower, should be in a cheaper market. You know, people are buying houses for that price, but it is how it works out. And, you know, for me, I was thinking about buying out of state, but when it comes down to it for me, what ended up being the reason that I didn't is I didn't have any landlord experience. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was looking for. To go learn another market would be pretty difficult. I have to go visit it a couple of times. So I was almost discouraged. I almost just said, screw it. I'm just going to put all my money into index funds and the stocks and all that stuff. I'm going to be done with this real estate thing. It doesn't work in California. Did some more research, ended up realizing, okay, well, I could, there's a niche here that works. And you know, you see like guys like me, Kevin are doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. There's a niche here that works and ended up doing that. And that's why it ended up working. So, so me, Kevin talks a lot about building up your net worth and building up your equity in your properties versus focusing so much on cash flow. And I think for his area, I agree with him. And for your area, I think that makes a lot of sense because once you factor in the expenses and probably if you really, if you, I don't know if you've done that full breakdown analysis that they like to do on bigger pockets. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with bigger yeah, pockets. I, I think bigger you are because you one of Brandon Turner's books is one of your favorite and it is of mine as well. And he talks about a few different categories of estimating expenses on properties that a lot of new real estate investors, new landlords don't really factor. And one of them being the capital expenditures, the replacement costs for things that go wrong in the building that will need to be paid for at some point in the future. And so for me, when I'm looking at the more expensive markets like yours in California, that is always in the back of my mind, how much of that cash flow, let's say, let's say the cash flow that is being estimated when you have the fixed expenses added up and subtracted from the rent is maybe just a thousand or two thousand dollars per month. But then you have some of these other non-fixed expenses, but certainly expenses that will come up. It tends to eat into your cash flow in those types of states. And so it seems to me like the play for a lot of investors, and you correct me if you have a different thought or different experience in California, but the play is more working toward the net worth, equity pay down and equity appreciation, and then profiting from the sale at some point. Is that what your mindset is on that? Yeah, it pretty much is. I mean, you hit it on the head that out here, we had 11% appreciation in 2020. That's pretty high. It's not as high as states like Idaho, but it, it's up there. So when you're looking at this state, it, it's an appreciation market. It's something that you can put a lot of money into it. You know, if you have a house that sells somewhere around 500,000, it needs to be fixed up. After you fix it up, it'll probably sell 580, 595. That's common. So if you can find one of those homes, put some floor, put some paint, it doesn't need to be grade A materials and people are still going to buy it because there's no inventory. So yeah, you put a little bit of work into it and you have a lot more equity than you had before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so what would you say to a brand new investor, someone who's maybe a year or two behind you, who is in California, and he's thinking, do I want to go out of state? Do I buy here? Do I not buy? Should I invest in something else? What would you say to them? That's a good question. That's a loaded question because it's really hard. You know, investing in California is never going to be easy. It's going to be more expensive. Construction costs are expensive. Everything's more expensive when you do it in California. And especially with Joe Biden's proposed tax credit that he's going to be giving that $15,000 tax credit. I really think middle America is going to have some serious appreciation going forward. If you can find a market in middle America, somewhere in Idaho, Texas, somewhere like that, Florida, that you're able to buy a property and you know that market, you know it well, it might be a better option if you really are stuck on wanting to be near you, which I think is probably the easier, more comfortable option for 99% of people, then yeah, it's, it, it can work. You just need to make sure you find your niche and find it. It's really hard to find it, but you need to find what's good for you. Find the market, you know, find the town that you know really well and find something that works. If you can do that and the numbers make sense, why not? I, I don't think California is ever going to drop even with all these people leaving the state, I don't think it's ever going to drop down to being a $300,000 market, a $400,000 market. I don't think my town will ever drop back down to low fives, like at the median ever again. So I think California will continue to appreciate. I think our government's going to be rough. I mean, we're having a recall right now. Everything's just, there's a lot of change. But if you find something, I don't think California is a bad market to invest in. And what about the eviction ban right now? Where does your city or town stand on that? And what about the state as a whole? 
Yeah, the state as a whole doesn't want you to evict anyone. That's that's they're big on that. That's you know, it, any state that's going to have the kind of politics that California and New York has is going to be more tenant friendly. It's big time. California, especially, is a renter state. It's the majority of people are renting here. It's the high prices. A lot of money is coming from different places and then moved out of state. A lot of people continue to own their home here instead of selling it, move out of state to an Idaho or whatever, rent that home and then make a killing because their payment's at $1,100 and they're renting it for $3,000. So yeah, the state's not for you evicting anyone. They're going to protect tenants all the way. Yeah. And for me, from on my end here in New York, our governor and our legislature just passed a new bill which prohibits evictions essentially through the end of April. And you know, there's some nuances with it as to what a tenant needs to submit. There's a form they need to submit if they're being evicted or if they're threatened with an eviction. But essentially, it's going to be a rubber stamp where every tenant is going to be protected at least through the end of April. And personally, I see that getting extended almost certainly, both on the federal and state level. So I think the March 31st goalpost right now is going to be pushed back. You know, Joe Biden is going to push it back and Governor Cuomo in my state is going to push his back as well. And so we're looking at landlords here are looking at most likely an eviction ban through the end of June, possibly even later, maybe even through September. And, you know, I know a lot of landlords who have been in the industry for a while and then maybe have a few properties or some with a lot of properties like myself and my business partner. And they certainly have at least a few tenants right now that owe them close to 10,000 or over $10,000 each. So there are a lot of landlords right now who are looking at losses that are exceeding tens of thousands of dollars, $30,000, $40,000 from all the eviction bans and their inability to recover the properties from the tenants. And so those folks, I think we might see an exodus from the mom and pop landlords who couldn't handle it, maybe over leveraged or just weren't necessarily savvy businessmen and women to be able to hold on to a property where they have to dig into their pocket every month to pay for it. So for my New York state audience, I see that as an opportunity. If you have the wherewithal and the means to scoop some of these properties that are going to be going on the market in the near future, I think probably middle of this year, then that's something that everyone should consider. And I don't know if that's going to be the case in your state or not, but I definitely see that as something that will happen in New York. Yeah, I definitely think that's a big time possibility in California. I think a lot of the people that own properties here are probably only owning one property. You know, the people that moved to Arizona, the people that moved to Nevada, they moved to Idaho, Oregon, whatever. And then they're continuing to rent that property. So like you said, they might not have a lot of experience to keep money in reserves. If something happens, if they're going to go X amount of months without having any rent, that might not be something that they can recover from. We might end up seeing a huge sell-off. That's a definite possibility. If there is a huge sell-off and prices drop 10%, 15%, I know I'm going to be buying. I think that's going to be a huge opportunity. I okay. think prices will eventually rebound. So yeah, I think that, I think you're hitting on the head right there. So I guess it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. So I want to switch gears a little bit because there's another aspect of what you're doing right now that I think is interesting to talk about. And that is YouTube. Yeah. I just got started with my page about two months ago, just started throwing content out there, ended up getting some momentum. So I'm just starting to get started. I'm thankful for you having me on the channel. You know, I know you have a big following, so really yeah, thankful. for sure. So how many subscribers do you have now? Around 650, just under that. There was a video I made on Dogecoin that everyone knows is happening with Dogecoin that jumped up like 4,000 views last night. So my subscribers changed quite a bit. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw that video. I watched it. It was interesting. Let's, let's just talk about that a little bit. So do, so let's let's back up. Some people don't even know about cryptocurrency or what that is. So maybe you can mention that a little bit first, and then we can talk about this specific coin. Yeah, so just cryptocurrency is just, it's decentralized digital currency that really doesn't have anyone that owns it. It's using blockchain technology and it's most commonly people are going to say Bitcoin and you've seen people become millionaires from Bitcoin. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so what's Do Dogecoin? <laughs> Dogecoin I can't pronounce started it right. as a, Yeah, Dogecoin was started as a meme. It was a joke coin. The owners really don't care about it. It's different than Bitcoin because it doesn't have a cap. So why Bitcoin has most of its value is because it doesn't have a cap. It's kind of like when the U.S. government backed our money by gold. There was a set amount. We knew we weren't going to just continue to print money. The Federal Reserve wasn't going to go crazy. That's why people have really attached to Bitcoin. Dogecoin doesn't have that. Dogecoin's a joke coin. It's really not going to explode like 
people think it's not going to be a ten thousand dollar coin i made a video about it because i thought it was interesting at the price it was at ended up putting like two grand into it and then as we saw it jump jump from one penny up to seven cents so I, it ended up being a pretty good day yesterday i sold it nice um, some people decided to hold it i i was perfectly content with that gain i don't yeah. think that's something that's it's, it's pure market manipulation. What you're seeing is these people on Reddit are pumping money into it, trying to make it more valuable than it is. It jumped from like 35th on the crypto list up to in the top 10. There's no way in, I know this is going to upset some people, it shouldn't be in the top 10. It really shouldn't. But it is an old cryptocurrency that's been around a long time. If you made some gains on it, I would probably take your gains. Nice. Yeah, that's great. I was going to ask you if you sold it or not and how much of a profit you made, but it sounds like it was a seven X type of an investment in a few days, right? Or, or a month or so. Yeah. Yeah. It, it ended up doing pretty well. So nice. I was, I'm very happy about it. So what's the general gist of your channel or what are the things that you talk about on your channel? What are the topics and themes that people should be looking for when they come to your channel? Yeah. So I, my main thing that I love talking about is real estate. I'm a real estate guy. I love real estate. But I also talk about stocks. I talk about just personal finance stuff in general, Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, different investment accounts, things like that. Savings accounts, credit cards, all pretty much everything you're going to hit on personal finance. I try and hit on my channel and just share what I've learned and how it's helped me grow. And why did you decide to start it? Why did you decide to start making videos? Yeah, I decided to start making videos, just watching people like Grant Stefan, Meet Kevin, all those channels, your channel. And um I just said, man, these guys are killing it. They're doing a great job. They're making money at it. So I'm like, why not? Maybe it'll be another source of income. If not, it'll be something I can show my kids one day documenting my journey. That's awesome. Yeah. Who's your favorite YouTuber? Oh, you, of course. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Who, who's your favorite YouTuber? Uh, it's probably going to be Grant Stefan. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, that guy, when I first got started in this whole investing everything, I first got started just index funds and really didn't know much about credit cards and all that. Watched a lot of his stuff, was reading a lot of books. I learned a lot from him and was really grateful for his channel. And so what is your ultimate goal with it? What would you like to see happen with your channel? Where would you like it to go? Yeah. So with my channel, I just, I would like to provide people as much value as I can. I, I believe if I continue to provide value, it'll grow. I'd love to see myself hit certain milestones. I'd like to get up to a thousand subscribers. 10,000 after that, 100,000. I think those are all the milestones we're all trying to hit. If I could hit that, that would be great. Really just depends on how much value I can provide people. And how did you learn to edit videos? How did you learn to structure your videos and talk on camera? Well, <laughs> the talking on camera, I don't know. It's just something that I've been able to do. I don't know how I really learned that. It just kind of came. But learning how to edit videos, oh my gosh, that was one of the most stressful. I know it's probably for you too. Time consuming, hardest things I do is editing videos. I use Adobe Premiere Pro, very, very hard. It takes a lot of time. Really was just watching YouTube videos. I think it was Think Media was one of the ones that I watched. They really helped me a lot. I really enjoyed their channel. And just from there, I was able to learn how to edit it and to put certain information in there that adds some value like news articles and then have them moving. And all of those things that look like they're easy took me a lot of time to learn. For sure. And you're not alone on that. I started my YouTube channel in 2019 and it's never been easy. None of the videos that I've done, even though they look like they're easy, they're maybe eight minutes long or 10 minutes long or 15 minutes long. Those things take hours and hours and hours. Planning them out, figuring out what you're going to say, executing it, actually talking on camera and then editing for hours. It's definitely not something that's easy to do. I think anybody can do it. I just think that a lot of people won't do it because it takes so much work and it's not just set it and forget it type of activity. And it's funny also that you mentioned Think Media because I've been following Sean Cannell and Think Media and some of his other channels. I think their newest one is Think Marketing, where they help entrepreneurs, investors, and business owners set up YouTube channels or advance their social media presence to help their businesses. And I actually purchased a course from Sean Cannell called the Video Ranking Academy, where he teaches pretty much from the beginning to the end, the entire process of how to set up a YouTube channel, record videos, and actually have some success on YouTube where you start getting some subscribers, you're being found on YouTube through ranking your videos and eventually, hopefully YouTube starts suggesting your videos. So I'd recommend it to you. I'd recommend it to other people who are interested in this. It's not necessarily a cheap course. 
to do, but I think it's 100% worth every penny. I paid for it and I've been going back through the course multiple times, answering kind of those questions that come up along the way. And he's been extremely helpful. And there's also a Facebook group where people will go on, ask questions of other group members. Sean does periodic interview videos and other community centered videos for his community. And I think it's a really powerful tool for anyone who's interested in YouTube. Yeah, I love him. He's, he's great. What, one of the things that he gave me advice on, so just not personal advice, but watching his channel, I learned, cause I started with, I, I started probably three months ago. I say two months because that's when I finally got a camera, yeah. finally got Adobe Premiere Pro and wasn't using my iPhone like vertical. So it was like this big on the screen the rest was black. So I don't count that anymore. <laughs> Cause I just, I deleted all those videos. They were really bad. I didn't understand that you needed a camera like this, that I'm not a techno person. I don't know technology very well. So watching him, I learned, oh yeah, I need to get a camera. I went and got a camera. And then from there I learned, oh, you need audio. Oh, you need lighting. Oh, you right. need something to actually edit this stuff. Oh, you need to write a script. And the script was game changing. It would literally take me hours. I would get so angry because I'd be like, okay, I'm going, I'm going. Mistake. Yep. Gotta fix that. All right, go, go, go. Mistake, mistake, mistake. And today it still takes me that long because I make so many mistakes. 100%. But at the end of the day, it's become a lot better. It's become fluid because now I have a script. I have something to go off of. I'll put my computer like over here and then I'll look at it and then I'll be like, okay. And then we just do it in clips now. That's and right. And then we just put it all together and it yeah. seems to flow better. Yeah. Same for me. And I've tried a few different techniques when it comes to executing the video itself. And there's different ones. Some people will use a, like a teleprompter, like a mini teleprompter. Yeah. I've tried that you know, with mixed results, there, there are challenges with everything. And I've tried scripting it out. I've tried ad-libbing and just going just free form. And it's all, it depends, you know, and sometimes it goes smoothly. Other times you need to do a lot of editing to cut out the mistakes or redo certain parts. It's a skill and it's something that you practice. And guys like Graham Stefan and me, Kevin, make it look super easy, but it's not as easy as it looks. But those guys have been doing it for a few years now. And doing multiple videos a week and in me, Kevin's case, multiple videos a day. And so when you've got that much practice, I think eventually you become really good at it. And it's like second nature. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I'm just getting started. You've been on here a little bit longer than I am. Uh, it's, it takes a long time. It's a skill. I can see just in these two months, how much improvement I've had first starting. I, I almost wanted to quit the project it took so long. It was like 10 hours just to get one video uploaded that was crummy. And I look back at it now and I'm like, that's my first video. I'm like, man, there's a lot of mistakes. I could have cut out a lot more. So it's not like these big like gaps in between my cuts or it's just like me sitting there quietly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I realize that now and I look at how much growth there was from that first video to now. And it's just been a vast improvement. The problem is just continuing to go and keeping that motivation. And I love your videos. I think your topics are super helpful for a lot of people. And I think you deliver the information really well. So I would encourage everyone watching this video to go to Chris's channel, subscribe to him and let him know if you do go to any of his videos, let him know that you went there because you saw him on this channel. So Chris, let's start wrapping this up. I want to kind of bring the interview to a close. And I want to talk to you about some of these questions that I like to ask people about what's their favorite real estate book and what's their favorite personal finance book? Do you have a couple of books in mind? Yeah. So real estate is going to be the book on real estate investing by Brandon Turner, but there's two books. I actually got both two of them right here, just so you guys can see them. One of them I really enjoyed. This was because I just got, when I first got started, it's the millionaire real estate investor by Gary Keller. Cause when I got started in real estate, I wanted to also learn how to be a real estate agent. And that's why I ended up liking Gary Keller because he started Keller Williams, the whole deal. Um, he had a book called the millionaire real estate agent. And I really liked that book. And then I got turned on to that one. And that was one of the first books I ever read on real estate investing. And it opened a lot of doors for me. And I learned a lot from it. A lot of the terms you need to know are in that book. So it was very valuable to me. And then the other one's rich dad, poor dad. I mm. love rich dad, poor dad. I, I read this book once a year. I, Robert Kiyosaki, the way that he breaks it down, what assets are and liabilities are completely changed my entire thinking. I went from thinking, Oh, I want to have nice cars. I want to have, you know, nice watches. I want all these nice things, which we all do, but they need to come after you have certain assets and things that can pay for them. You know, you buy, you want a nice car, go buy a real estate investment that cash flows enough money to pay for that car payment. And that was my new mindset from that. So I love this book. I read it once a year, just as a reminder. hundred percent. Yeah. And I'm with you on both of those books and definitely rich dad, poor dad. It's one of the books that I think changed a lot of lives 
across the world and in the United States. And one of the uses that I suggest to people for that book, obviously for their own knowledge and information, but aside from that, also, if they have a spouse or a partner who maybe doesn't know anything about personal finance or real estate, doesn't have that right mindset, and maybe they're kind of at an odds with the person who does, like if you are the one who's interested and you want to go forward, you want to start investing in assets as opposed to liabilities, and your partner doesn't really know anything about that, and there may be some tension or resentment, I highly recommend that you just ask them, say, I want you to read this book. Let's not talk about this anymore. Just read it cover to cover. Promise me that you'll read it and then we can talk about it and then we'll see where your mindset is as compared to where it was before. And that was huge for me. I'm married. My wife and I have been together for over 10 years now. She didn't really have that same exact mindset as me when it came to being an entrepreneur or being an investor, kind of taking those risks. Whereas once I kind of put her onto that book, I said, you got to read this. Just read it. Just take a look through it. And, you know, she wasn't necessarily a person who spent a lot or didn't save. Like she was a saver and she was into very conservative, the standard, you know, retirement account types of investments. But I wanted to take it a step further with real estate and with some of these non-traditional investments. And I think once she read it, she was kind of all in on board. And I, I highly recommend that for people who have partners or spouses who maybe are not necessarily on the same page as you. I think that's a great book for that, just to open their eyes to another way of thinking. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that because when I first met my girlfriend, we've been together about three years now. She didn't have that same mindset. It was something that was really important to me. I gave her a couple books. She read them and I've seen 10x growth in the last three years on her. She's saving a lot of money now. She wants to buy a property eventually. She's a huge growth just by reading books and following that same stuff that you said. Awesome. Cool. Well, Chris, thanks again for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you? Yeah. So I'm obviously on YouTube. My name's Chris Futrell. You can find my channel. I'll comment in the comment section. And then I'm also on Instagram. My username is Chris Futrell 21. And yeah, those are the two main places you can find me on Instagram. I put on my story there pretty much all day, every day, just what I'm doing. Awesome, man. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care. You as well.